officers and where we elect board members. There's some pretty nice people that have served to help us put this museum together. Many of you have been here before, many of you have not. Less than two years ago, this museum was just a conversation. Now it is not only a reality, but it is an idea that this time has come. That we have created here a wonderful institution which is telling the story of a community, a tough, tough little city that has survived, picked itself up by its bootstrap time after time, reinvented us, way more than once, and kept on going. Found a way to make a living on a barrier island that is not easy. There have been many unwelcome summer guests. They are called hurricanes, but you are not allowed to say the H word the way you were here. They have wiped us out and started our history over. There are many among us who are history freaks. I hope that there are a lot of them in the crowd. And the people that are going to speak to you tonight are well qualified to keep you satisfied with the person. I would like you to stand and welcome a very distinguished warrior, Mr. Harry Shaw. He was in the back.
like to do so. She's a colleague of mine on the New Oasis County Historical Commission, which is the arm of the Texas Historical Commission in New Oasis County. In the state, each county has a commission that represents the Texas Historical Commission. And Mary Jo is one of our members. In 1966, Mary Jo Arrears received a baccalaureate degree in English and History from the Centenary College of Louisiana. She then worked as a secondary teacher in the Corpus Christi Independent School District for 32 years, receiving a master's degree in interdisciplinary studies at Texas A&M University, Corpus Christi in 1973. She returned to college after retirement and earned a master's degree in history and social science from Texas A&M University, Kingsville in 2001. Don't you love America? Afterwards, she taught in the United States History at Del Mar College and has been Vice President and Secretary of the New Oasis County Historical Society and was Treasurer of the South Texas Historical Association. She has also spoken for the Texas State Historical Association and the East Texas Historical Association and as part of the Corpus Christi Museum's Winter Texan series. Her article, Silver Line Storm, the impact of 1919 hurricane on the port of Corpus Christi won the Keith Guthrie Memorial Award from the New Oasis County Historical Association in 2005 and the H. Daly Carroll Award from the Texas State Historical Association in 2006. Another work, Directing at the River, Unionist and Secessionist on the New Oasis, 1862, was released in 2009 as part of an anthology, Seventh Star of the Confederacy, about Civil War Texas. Her book, Storm Over the Bay, The People of Corpus Christi and Their Port, published by Texas Union Press, also came out this spring. In May, she was one of the recipients of the Daniel Kilgore Historical History Award presented by the New Oasis County Historical Association. She continues to research early 20th century South Texas in between trips to visit her daughter, son in law, and two beautiful grandgirls in California. And I presume to pick up Nobel Prizes and other things. <laughs> no further ado, would you uh, give it up for her? Um, 
European history, world history, which I had never realized before. I'd always got, gotten off on Russian history and English history and things like that. And then I began to realize how much had happened in this area. And I got the name from that game that was very popular several years ago, and I think still is, it's on the internet, it's the Kevin Bacon game. It was a bunch of people who worked in Hollywood, and they had gotten together one evening, probably after drinking or something, and started realizing that although they were all in the entertainment world, and they all knew of Kevin Bacon, they, none of them knew him directly, but all of them had a friend or a business associate who was connected to Bacon indirectly. And um, these intermediaries that we all have between one person and another that we don't know, sociologists term degrees of separation. And I think they've even done a study somewhere where they decided that a person could be connected to a total stranger on the other side of the earth by no more than six degrees of separation, or six intermediaries. Anyhow, the idea fell on several years ago. There was a, a TV series called Six Degrees of Se Separation. Um, a Broadway show, all sorts of things. What brought me, it brought it to me was the idea that if Kevin Bacon was kind of the center of attention in Hollywood, maybe Corpus, in its struggle to get a deep water port, was in itself sort of the center, was within six degrees of separation of four presidents that we'll be talking about, three movies, some of which I'm sure you <laughs> Two nationally known figures and one scientific chart. Now, how did this all come about? It all started, I recall, January 27, 1909, when a young Roy Miller received a late afternoon telegram from Congressman John Garner. The committee has just agreed to approve survey for 25 foot channel. Congratulations, signed John Nance Garner. Ecstatic after a frenzied day of long distance last minute lobbying, Miller and his business associates had good reason to be happy. For years, ever since the town's beginning in 1846, entrepreneurs had tried to develop Corpus Christi's geographic advantages. Vast, fertile plains, abundant with deer and prairie birds and droves of wild horses, soared to a 50-foot bluff that dropped down to a large, circular, beach and raft bay. Protected on the east by a series of barrier islands and fed from the west by the Noises River, the bay flowed into a quiet lagoon you're all familiar with, christened Laguna Madre, a natural passageway for vessels of all kinds. Whether one was maneuvering in from the Gulf of Mexico, 20 miles away, or sailing up from Port Isabel, Corpus Christi was a logical stopping off point. And over the years, three different railroad companies had extended their lines there. Since the end of the Mexican War, sheepmen and cattlemen had headquartered there, and new irrigation techniques were now bringing corn and cattle, uh, cotton farmers to the little town. By 1909, Corpus Christi had become the major retail center of Deep South Texas, but as a shipping center, it was a bust. Instead of huge, ocean-going freighters, small skiffs and shallow, rampant sloops crisscrossed the bay. It was they that hauled cargo to the wharves of Corpus Christi, cargo laboriously unloaded from larger ships that could go no farther inland than St. Joseph or Mustang Island. The problem lay in block passes, which y'all have this wonderful exhibit in the museum, uh, and a very, very deceptively shallow bay floor. Eventually, the U.S. Corps of Engineers stabilized the passes, but the depth of the bay remained so unpredictable that most big sea operators simply avoided Corpus Christi altogether, choosing instead to harbor in far more accessible island towns like Galveston. But the horrific 1900 hurricane set Galveston back, and new engineering developments created new opportunities. 
Government ships were now able to drag shallow areas into long deep water canals and had already turned Buffalo Bayou into a major shipping thoroughfare. If Houston could get a seaport, why not Corpus Christi? So civic leaders, Roy Miller on the forefront, began an aggressive campaign for a government-funded 25-foot deep channel cut across the bay floor from the Gulf through Laguna Madre to six wars. And on that cold January day, 1909, the sea made succeed that the Rivers and Harbors Committee would help them achieve that dream. But Congressman Garner had omitted a vital fact in his telegram to Miller. The U.S. Corps of Engineers still had not chosen a site for its proposed channel, and regional rivals like Rockport and Aransas past Port Aransas had already thrust themselves into competition. Then, to the utter amazement and disgust of leaders like Miller, Port Aransas won the coveted Rivers and Harbors 1910 designation. Before long, a deeper channel would lead to a harbor on Harbor Island, and private interests would fund a railroad and wharf facilities there. To get its deep water port, Corpus Christi would have to start all over again and survive coastal rivals, political grafters, feuding factions, tropical hurricanes, and the most complicated reform movement ever to hit Texas. This movement was progressivism a nationwide drive in the late 1800s to eradicate institutional corruption and purify private behavior. <laughs> Progressives have advocated a perfectible human nature grounded in solid white Protestant middle class values, fortified by breakthroughs in medicine, natural science, and psychology. They considered man the ultimate actor in his universe, vulnerable only to corruption of his own making. Therefore, it behooved reformers of all kinds, muckrakers, settlement house workers, legislators, union activists, suffragists, and teetotalers to rid society of all sin. And they accomplished a tremendous amount of good over the years. National standards for meat and drug products were instituted. Monopolies and trusts were broken apart. State prohibitions on child labor were set. Prison reform. But not every region defined reform the same way, and by the time the progressive movement hit Texas, it had corkscrewed itself to the conservative bent of the state. In industrial north, business reform meant union representation. In mostly rural Texas, it meant a regulated railroad. In the Midwest, women's suffrage meant universal balance. In Texas, women could vote in primary elections only, and then some had their ballots thrown out after the first election. In the East, progressives canvassed for a constitutional amendment outlawing alcohol. In Texas, prohibitionists got no farther than local option for a long time. But the biggest twist in Texas progressivism involved electoral reform, where progressives across the nation invaded its machine politics, Boss Tweed and Tammany Hall, Texas progressives set about disfranchising whole segments of the voting population. It was the actions of this last group, the purifying progressives, that nearly scuttled Corpus Christi's dream of getting a deep water port. These purifiers targeted several groups, one of them were Mexican Americans many of whose families had been part of the trans Oasis Valley since it belonged to Spain. Unused to the rough and tumble politics of the early republic and imbued with Patron Payon traditions from the old country, many rural Tejanos had traded their work, their loyalty, and their votes to landlords in exchange for our protection and security. The bargain paid off for both sides as the new century wore on. Turbulence from Mexico, including border raids by Pancho Villa and others, sparked angry Anglo retribution. Only the patronage of a strong ranchero could secure a vaquero safety for his family. His folk, on the other hand, sustained the power of bosses like Robert Clayburgh, who as King Ranch overseer managed a considerable amount of South Texas, and Archie Parr, who controlled virtually all of Duval County. 
But theirs and other well-oiled board machines were coming under increasing fire from reformers, both native and new to Texas. The only way to dethrone such political bosses, these progressives felt, was to permanently remove their Mexican-American compadres from the voting laws. One method involved a 1905 act requiring a statewide primary for any political party polling over 100,000 votes. Claiming private membership privileges, many regional democratic organizations restricted participation in their county primaries to white voters only. Moreover, white depended upon each region's definition of the term. But the goal, disfranchisement, remained the same. White primary strictures were still optional, however, and inoperable during general elections. In order for complete disfranchisement of all considered undesirable, Texas progressives needed to make voting a financial burden, and they did it with the poll tax. Ostensibly written to benefit the public schools, the 1903 measure charged a baseline registration fee of $1.75, amounting to almost 1% of a farm family's annual income. An additional dollar added by some cities brought the total to 275. For hotel porters or railroad foremen, the outlay amounted to at least one tenth of a week's salary, nearly all of a whole day's pay, equivalent of a college instructor having to pay $76 to pay today, to vote today. Yearly renewal, along with a short six-month window in which to register, contributed to the requirements. Between the increasing numbers of white primaries and the state imposition of poll taxes, the result in the next election was an electorate cut to almost one-third its earlier size. But there was an unexpected backfire. South Texas political machines had managed to survive.
his partitions to emerge an even more powerful political boss in his own domain. But Parr was overt, blunt, and violent. While his machine-dominated Duval County landslides became a tradition in South Texas politics, also unlike Clayburgh, Parr promoted himself. By 1914, the Oligar Democrat had become a member of the Texas Senate, and two years later brought Walter Pope into the State House as representative for South Texas. For a while, both sides, progressives and old guards, united in the struggle to get state and federal funding for a Corpus Christi court. Within two years, Parr and Pope had pushed a bill through the legislature to provide partial funding for the channel. But the statewide driver reform was overtaking the local fight for deep water. By 1918, progressives had already removed one governor from office, put another in its place, and with the support of the president's attorney general, had sentenced five Nueces County officials to jail for voter fraud. Now they turned their sights upon unseating Senator Parr. Clayburgh's led the charge, but the crown jewel of the progressive onslaught was Roy Miller, and he let the inductees fly. Duval County was a carnival of corruption and fraud, he declaimed, where men and women, not citizens of the United States, who could neither read nor write, were used by the machine to pile up the fictitious majority necessary to give Mr. Parr the votes he needed. Conventions that endorsed Parr were packed at the 11th hour by Aztec henchmen from the Rio Grande. And supporters of Parr were purveyors of booze and vice of purchased governors, of salary brewery lawyers, of corruptionists of every hue and kind who for years have not hesitated to traffic in the very bodies and souls of men and women. No matter that Robert Clayburn had manipulated the votes of his workers for decades, nor that Miller himself had supported the acquittal of 42 men accused of election abuse three years earlier. The chase was on and the mayor was leading the pack. Watching from afar was Walter Pope. Stymied once already in his attempt to profit from a bankrupt development bill, the conflict between the mayor and himself had become personal. But it would have to wait until Parr secured his Senate seat, and he did. Progressive, statewide, and national retired in defeat. It was time to rest and regroup. The battles in Corpus Christi were just beginning. Within four days of Parr's victory, a small announcement appeared in the car. Miller's position as mayor was being challenged by Walter Pope's own partner, Gordon Boone. But the big bombshell came days later. In a strident and explosive ad that ran in every local paper, Boone accused Miller of taking payoffs amounting to over $300 a month from a secret group of businessmen. Roy Miller, that bastion of progressive virtue, that advocate of good government so quick to criticize Parr and his minions, had been receiving illicit funds for almost a year. A series of ads threw Miller's self-proclaimed piety back at him. It is safer to vote for a man with a conscience and a man who only wants to do right will consult that conscience before consulting his lawyer. For Miller had consulted his lawyer. The first article to refute Boone's allegation was written by the city attorney. But his argument that Miller had indeed taken the money, but only as a form of employment by businessmen of the city to advance the commercial and military interests of Corpus Christi, fell abysmally flat. What did emerge was Miller's deep hatred for his own antagonists and a genuine fear that his years-long struggle for the deep water port would result in a wholesale donation of the waterfront to a few schemers. By the end of the campaign, he was almost incoherent in his appeals to the public to support his re-election. The answer lay with the electorate, and new progressive restrictions on literacy and citizenship had already decimated poll registration. By the time the last ballot was in on April 1st, 1919, only 938 had voted and almost 40% decrease in turnout from four years earlier. Nor were the results any better for Miller. Although he kept the support of the business community, the remaining precincts had turned against him some by as much as 60%. 
Boone and Pope's carefully selected city council were now in charge of Corpus Christi politics and growing out of his dire fears that Bay and Channel development would be ignored <coughs> began to come true. Within two months after taking office, the new city council had become mired in a lawsuit, tangled in a bank controversy, and immersed in personal arguments. No work was being done for the port. The drive was gone. The momentum had fled the city. The optimism of the progressive era had dissipated into disillusionment, disgust, and despair. A long, hot summer settled on the Corpus Christi. Then the hurricane struck. Circling west from its origins in the Caribbean, this particular storm had approached the city slowly, so erratic that storm signals were taken down for a few hours the day before it hit. So were wary. Early that Sunday morning, Miller hastened his wife and four sons to a downtown hotel, striving for a better shelter than their beachfront home. Walter Pope, just returned from a speaking engagement, stayed secure in his mother-in-law's home on the hill, as did Gordon Boone, who lived with his wife and daughter some blocks over. But few others took warning. Natives of Corpus Christi had long ago determined that a 50-foot high block protected them from nature's incursions and the fact that most businesses, two hospitals, several hotels, a military tent city, and a new housing subdivision were on a beach three feet above sea level seemed to have simply escaped people's notice until the hurricane struck. Arriving in full force by 3 o'clock Sunday afternoon on September 14th, its surge time swept across two barrier islands carrying drowned cattle, humans, and barrels of crude oil. Crashing onto the beachfront of the city, it merged with the waters of the back bay, creating 15-foot waves where homes had stood six hours earlier. The accompanying winds, thunder, lightning, and rain blended with the screams of children ripped from their parents' arms and babies sucked under the wreckage. By the time dawn broke on Monday morning, the Corpus Christi Bayfront had ceased to exist becoming instead a turgid wallow of drowned humans, twisted trolley cars, floating lumber, rotting carcasses, and uprooted trees, none of which became apparent to bluff residents until they emerged from their homes and looked down. The shock was traumatic. Original counts estimate that over 600 died that Sunday and damage on the Bayfront totaled over $20 million. More than 4,000 were homeless, and hospital and medical facilities were non-existent. The demands upon municipal leaders were overwhelming. So Mayor Boone asked for help. Within 24 hours, he had contacted the U.S. Army, the Red Cross, and Roy Miller. 24 hours after that, the General Relief Committee was born. Headed jointly by Boone and Miller, the committee put every political leader in the community to work. The restoration of the business and beach section progressed so effectively that five days later, the head of the U.S. Army was able to release his command to the National Guard and take his troops home. And if such antagonistic fast factions should unite so readily to clean up the city, what else could they not achieve? The answer came at a special meeting held October 1st with Congressman Carlos B. from Washington. We want to build a seawall said Mayor Hood. He then spread out a map showing how it would be possible to construct the seawall around the city and into Nueces Bay, thus providing a fully protected land-backed harbor which could handle shipping of all classes. A seawall had become the key to the port, hooking its construction to that of a land-backed international maritime harbor, removed the deep water port from partisanship and made it a practical necessity and a lot easier to sell. The race was on again, and this time rejuvenated by survival. Virtually every political and property owner along the Nueces Strip became involved, this time determined to outmaneuver old rivals like Rockport and Port Aransas. By May 1922, Corpus Christi had been designated the site for a new deep water port. So the port was built. Its deep and channel cargo docks and turning basin taking form within five years after initial construction began. Ecstatic success, city leaders chose September 14th to dedicate the port, seven years to the day the 1919 hurricane hit. 
Of the men who stood on the platform on Dedication Day, 1926, Archie Parr was least changed by time. So necessary to the court that the Corpus Christi Caller now lauded him, one of the outstanding members of the state senate, Parr continued to wield power bluntly and openly, and was especially quick to punish upstarts, even as he had done his closest supporter, W.E. Pope. Rising triumphant from the Miller mayoral defeat, Pope dared to dream of the gubernatorial chair, so he left his seat in the House, entered the 1924 race for governor, and failed to even make the run. But possibly the greatest blow came in a letter from his erstwhile protector. When I saw how things were going, Parr wrote after the primary, I gave my vote to your opponent. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Introduced to the dedication crowd only as their former state representative. It would be another year before Pope could run once more for his old seat. One who would never run again or ride was Robert J. Claver chosen as honorary chairman of the Court Celebration Committee because of his long fight for a deep water court. Clayburg was not on the platform with the others. He had suffered a stroke just months earlier that left him crippled and near death. His sons would have to continue his legacy. All they needed was someone to show them the ropes. And that's just what Roy Miller was planning to do. His brilliance bringing people together for the court secured him a place in the celebration. But the secret salary remained like a sore tooth, souring his image in the mind of the public. That and the loss of his baby son and namesake just a year after the storm had blunted the vaunted enthusiasm of the boy of Corpus Christi. He and his wife would stay in the coastal bend and raise their remaining three boys, but his role would now be behind the scenes, pushing Clayburg interests in his own and other ways. As the ceremonies wound down on Dedication Day, not a few thought back to that cold January 27, 1909. Only 17 years had passed since John Nance Garner sent that excited telegram to Roy Miller, but a lot had happened. Progressivism peaked, prohibition seemed entrenched, and poll taxes had robbed two-fifths of the city's populace of their votes. An entire era had ended by 1926 but Corpus Christi got its deep water poor. Now, the connection. What has this to do with degrees of separation, or as I prefer, Kevin Bacon would be? <laughs> First of all, the movies. Uh, I'm sure a lot of us remember Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Um, it was one of the classic Coen Brothers films that came out several years ago, and the music from it won a Grammy for that particular year. If you've seen it either in the theater or on DVDs or on TV, you know the opening scene, the uh, protagonists, these three right here, are escaping from a penal form. Now, what is this to do with Corpus Christi? At the end of that voter fraud trial in Corpus Christi in 1915, I was telling you about, remember, there were five defendants who had been convicted. Three of those defendants were sentenced to the federal penitentiary and two to the county jail. Had they served their time, those in the county jail would have been part of the transition from the convict lease system. And that's what you have on your left. This is the way prisoners have been treated for decades in, in the counties and in the state of Texas. Literally had been chained. Uh, their labor would be leased out to landowners or farmers, and um, whatever happened to the convicts under those leases happened. You know, there was no responsibility. It's an extremely brutal system. Well, this was going under changes because of the progressives, and they were going to a more progressive penal form system, which is where the movie takes place, in a very nice, clean, colorful penal form. This picture on your right is a scene from the actual penal form uh, that the photographer was in. It's the train section. And I swear you can smell it from here. <laughs> so real reform didn't start in the prison system until the 1920s. Now, the next film, and starring Pancho Diaz himself. This was an HBO film that 
came out several years ago with Antonio Banderas and the role of Pancho Villa, and he made a magnificent Pancho Villa. <laughs> what did this to do with Corpus? One of the first wars captured on 20th century film, the Mexican Revolution, was highlighted by the coverage of General Francisco Pancho Villa, born Dorotea Aranjo contracting with the Mutual Film Corporation for a full-length movie about his life, which is what that film was about. Villa became a true media hero and made the revolution real for many Americans. His subsequent invasion of New Mexico in 1916 never diminished his mythic status, but it heightened fears of citizens on both sides of the border. In July, President Wilson federalized the state's militia into the National Guard, and over 100,000 men from all over the country were patrolling the U.S.-Mexico boundary line by November 1916. Many were still stationed there after the end of World War I, and 22 of them, who had come to Corpus Christi to set up a rest and relaxation camp, were killed by the September hurricane of 1919. Giant, wonderful movie, came out in the 50s. For those people that remember back then, and I do remember because my mother and grandmother were members of the Book of the Month Club and both had read the novel Giant that was written by Edna Ferber. Not long after the release of the novel, Lester Guns, owner of the Corpus Christi Book and Stationery Store, invited Miss Ferber and her son to the city. You know, they had written about Texas, and they could come to Texas and sign their books. So the guns had a book signing for Miss Ferber and her son, and took them out to eat later. However, she was not much of a success, nor was her son. Nobody liked her arrogant attitude, and nobody appreciated the way she portrayed Texas women in the book. She was familiar enough with South Texas, however, to model her main protagonist, the Rock Hudson movie character, after Robert Claiborne's youngest son, Bob, who married the Virginia-educated congressman's daughter, Helen Campbell, the Elizabeth Taylor character, after a whirlwind courtship of 21 days, truly 21 days, is how long we knew each other for them here. Their story, which encompasses Texas passage from agriculture to oil and includes references to Dr. Hector Garcia and the Felix Longoria case, comprises much of the novel. The movie came out in 1956, just a year after Rosa Parks refused to move in a segregated bus and in the midst of Martin Luther King's Montgomery bus boycott. John had reminded the nation, as well as Texans, the state had its own complex civil rights problems. And the presidents. President Theodore Roosevelt, T.R. and his boy pulpit helped make progressivism popular. But it was during his administration that the Texas Republican Party stripped black members from its roles. A Corpus Christi activist, John C. Scott, ran as a lily white Republican, and that was the term he used against John Nance Garner in 1902 and lost, even though he carried the Oasis County. Woodrow Wilson. Democrat Woodrow Wilson felt increasing alarm about the power of political bosses symbolized to him by the notorious Boss Tweed. But it was his Justice Department that instigated the 1915 electoral fraud cases against Archie Carr and those 42 Oasis County citizens. Warren G. Harding, he's easy, he's the one that signed the bill approving Corpus Christi as the site for a deep water port in 1922. And finally, Lyndon Baines Johnson. Johnson had good reason to be grateful to two Corpus Christi residents, and I'm not even going to talk about Archie Carr and Box 13. <laughs> It was Roy Miller, campaign manager for Robert Clayburgh's oldest son, Richard, who suggested that young Lyndon be the new representative's congressional aide in 1931. 
Miller's suggestion to put LBJ smack in the middle of Washington politics, where he became an associate of soon-to-be Vice President John Nance Garner. And finally, Hector Garcia. Another Corpus Christi resident, Dr. Hector P. Garcia, helped Johnson win the presidency with his Viva Johnson campaign and his pay the poll tax drawings. In 1964, the 24th Amendment abolished the poll tax requirement for federal elections, and in 1966, poll tax payments in state and local elections were declared unconstitutional by the United States Supreme Court, both events occurring during the Johnson administration. And finally, the scientific chart. Forced to flee his home on North Beach when the hurricane of 1919 hit Corpus Christi, little Robbie Simpson never forgot having to tie his grandmother to a wheelchair so she could float across the raging waters. Years later, as director of the National Hurricane Center, he and his associate, Herbert Sapir, devised the Sapir-Simpson Hurricane Damage Scale so no one again would ever be quite as unprepared for a disaster as was Corpus Christi that September day, 91 years ago. And that's it. <laughs>
Darling. Now, Grace Darling, of course, did it. Actually, in looking up the name Grace Darling, like on the internet, there, there actually was, in England, a young daughter of a lighthouse keeper who actually had helped her father in saving some shipwrecked passengers there off the coast of England. So it's got a kind of like the pseudonym then for this heroine who supposedly rescued the garrison of Fort Sims. And then the, okay, this is the account in the Corpus Christi collar. There's got to be this. The reporter for the Corpus Christi collar wrote the story even as he identifies Finally, the girl of the, the, the woman has now died, so now they feel that they can finally reveal the name. She didn't want to be identified because she considered to be unmaidenly, unmaidenly for a young 14 year old girl to actually pilot a ship at all, too, with the, uh, uh, the soldiers aboard. So the article reads When the first ships bearing troops, of the Federal Army arrived offshore at the Rangers Pass, there were only a handful of Confederate soldiers on Mustang Island and none on St. Joseph's. With nothing but muskets to defend the pass and no fortification, they were in imminent peril. Two, without their aid, Corpus Christi would quickly fall hands into the hands of the Northern Army. Apparently, the Confederates prepared to leave then it was found out that the only two men who knew the narrow twisting channel around Catfish Bend through Redfish Bay by McGloin's Bluff and across Corpus Christi Bay were not present. And without a pilot, it would be impossible to get through. Something must be done, and at once. They would not surrender. They would choose a soldier's death, die fighting. It would be best to retreat to the sand hills. Then the 14-year-old girl spoke up. I know the channel, she asserted. I will take you through. With this child, later known as Grace Darling, at the helm, the soldiers arrived in Corpus Christi. So it was the legend. Uh, all the way up to 1939, and I thought surely, you know, maybe it would be recreated elsewhere and no one elsewhere in all too. But uh, the thing is that the article finally revealed the name of the uh, 14-year-old girl, and her name was Priscilla Stevenson. And the man, actually, the man she's going to marry was one of those, actually, Henry Holly. Uh, there was lots of other men who was in the garrison here, too. But uh, it, just, it just does not make sense at all. It just, uh, they're waiting for news. They're frantic. In, in fact, uh, the uh, General Hamilton B., who had arrived in Corpus Christi, uh, with, and actually sent out the